Romans 6, and we're going to look at verse 14 through 23 today. Now, Paul is giving us here in this first verse that we're going to look at here in verse 14, one of the most profound promises in all of Scripture. It's a promise that I believe every single one of us in this room needs to appropriate and apply and receive. It's based on a principle that is equally important. And so look for the promise and the principle as we read this first verse here through this section. In verse 14, Paul says, For sin shall not have dominion over you. Put your name in there. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin, And having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now here in verse 14, I believe is one of the most powerful promises that could be known to men. That you can be free from the dominion of sin in your life. So this is the promise that God makes to his people. Sin shall not have dominion over you. Now he is not talking about becoming sinless. He is not talking about never sinning again. He is talking about the dominion of sin. The word dominion here is a Greek word that literally means to rule, to master, to control, or to have lordship. Now, A.T. Robertson, one of the great Greek scholars of the past, he translates this particular phrase here, for sin shall not lord over you, which I believe brings the sense, the understanding of what Paul is declaring here. So the issue here is what is the sin that you struggle with? That sin should not have dominion over you. If you are living under the principle, the foundational principle that is taught here, living under grace, you are not under law but grace. So he puts these two things together because they go together. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Why? Because you're not under law, but under grace. So think of the promise here first. I want you to apply this promise and see the power of this promise. This is the promise of the gospel. When Jesus first preached the gospel for the very first time, it says in Luke 4.18 that he stood up in the synagogue and he read from the book of Isaiah and he read this verse. 
The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives. There it is. That is why he came, to liberate captives. I was a captive, and I am no longer a captive to sin. The way I know I'm no longer a captive is because I am not practicing those sins any longer. That is the way you know you are not captive because you're not living that way anymore. He has liberated you from the captivity of your sin. Now notice he goes on there in that same verse to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. So he says it a second time. Liberty twice mentioned in this opening salvo of the gospel proclaimed by Christ. He shoots this message out and he says liberty twice because that's what the gospel promises. Liberty. So that you do not have to be a slave to any sin in your life. Now that is the promise of the gospel. So your anger and your resentment does not have the right to control you or master you or lord over you anymore. Your envy or your jealousy or your whatever you want to put into that category, what, you fill in the blank. Whatever that issue is, does not have to have dominion over you anymore. So is that what you want? If that's what you want, how do you get it? Well, you've got to come to God by grace. If you come through law, you will never experience it. So if you are being controlled and mastered by any sin, you don't know what this fundamental principle of grace is all about. You may know it in your mind, but you do not know it practically in your life. You're not living under grace. Because grace is not something that people use for an excuse to continue to sin. It's something that they see is the fundamental principle to set them free from the power of sin so that they might obey God unto righteousness. So that is the message that is here. Now to understand the difference between law and grace is essential. If you are going to experience God's victory in your life, you have to understand the difference between the two. You see, grace is where you depend on His favor to change you. You depend on His power to change you. You depend on His finished work to change you. Instead of, under law, you depend on yourself to change you. You depend on your ability, your strength, your sufficiency, your ability. That's law. You see, law is what I have to do. Grace is depending on what He has already done and depending on Him to do that work inside you right now. Now, when you find that you are struggling with anger or pride or jealousy or lust or whatever the sin is, do you hear yourself cry out for grace? Do you hear that come out of your mouth? If you do, then you understand the principle of living under grace. You understand it, you get it, and you are crying out for it. But if you hear, oh Lord, help me to just be more faithful. Help me to just try a little harder next time then you are living under a principle of law, of self-effort, of self-deliverance. Grace is His power to deliver. So which one do you cry out for? Which one do you live under? Law 
or grace. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, there the Lord said to Paul one of the most important, one of the most powerful and well-known passages of Scripture. There the Lord said to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now the verbs in that particular promise are essential to understand. They are both in the present tense. So literally, Jesus is saying here, My grace is continually sufficient for you. My strength is continually made perfect in your weakness. So just because you have a weakness means nothing. It's whether you depend on his sufficient grace to help you in that weakness. So are you depending upon his grace so that you live under his grace in enabling you to follow him? I believe that when you depend upon grace, it's just like pulling the power cord out of the wall on some machine that is in progress. I mean, you turn any machine on, you go over and you pull that power plug out of the wall, what happens? That machine grinds to a halt. When you depend on grace, you are depriving the power of sin and your sin nature of its power source. The harder you try, the worse it becomes. The more you depend on His grace, the easier it becomes. Now, I'm not saying that the Christian life is easy, because it's not. But it's way easier than anything else you've ever tried. Any other means, any other method that you've ever tried. And so, law brings defeat. Grace brings His strength in the midst of your weakness. Now, the only reason why we do not experience His grace, the fundamental reason, is we don't ask for it. I mean, Jesus said, everyone that asks, it shall be given. That's what He promises. So if I ask, I will receive His grace. It says in James chapter 4, verse 2, James said, you do not have because you do not ask. It's that simple. I do not have the grace that it will make me sufficient for the weakness in my own life because I don't ask. But why don't we ask? Well, I believe it's because my nature is basically independent. That's what sin is. It's it's an independence inside. I want to do it. I can handle this. I don't need anybody. I mean, that's where we all were before we came to Christ, wasn't it? We were all saying, I can handle it. I can do life apart from God. I don't need no God in my life. That's our response. Until I come to the conclusion, I do need the Lord. I do need help because I am a sinner. Notice in James chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, there James says, Do you think that the Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now this is a passage of Scripture that is much misunderstood. In fact, some of your Bibles have a big S there for Spirit as though it refers to the Holy Spirit. But it has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit. It has everything to do with your spirit, your sinful nature, the spirit that lives inside of you, the spirit that is lusting against the Spirit of God, that's that's desiring constantly contrary to what God desires for you, is constantly lusting enviously. Now that's what the words there, yearns, jealously, that's what it means. It means to lust enviously. Now the way that we know that this is referring to the struggle that we have is the very next verse. The very next verse says this, but he gives more grace. 
Now, if this is not referring to your sinful nature that lusts enviously after what it thinks is going to satisfy it, then why would he give you more grace? You see, the whole point of this is that I am a person who is constantly looking for something to satisfy me. And yet God will give me more grace, more grace than the struggle that I have. Where sin abounded, remember at the end of Romans 5, Paul said where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So God gives more grace. Notice the next part of that verse. He says, therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So what's my problem? My problem is my pride. My pride says, I can handle this. I can do whatever I need to do to change my own life. Pride is what keeps me from receiving grace. It's what keeps me from prayer and asking for help. So, are you somebody who is, sees their need and cries out for grace to meet that need? Because His grace is sufficient for you. Now, the second point of this study this morning is in verses 15 through 23. Here Paul answers this question of why we should not continue to sin because God has placed us under His grace. Now this is a return to where Paul started. Notice, chapter 6, verse 1. Turn over there with me. Remember, this was how he opened chapter 6. He says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And his answer is, of course not. Certainly not. His answer is the same here. Notice verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under a law but under grace? Certainly not. Those, those words certainly not means perish the thought. Put it out of your mind. Don't even think and begin to think in that direction. Because grace is not given to excuse me so I can continue to sin. It is given to forgive me so I will stop living in sin. And I will obey God's command. That's why he gives me grace. So his point here is very simple. He's saying, don't misuse God's grace. Just because you're not under some law principle, but there's this abundant grace that God gives more grace, don't play a game with him. Don't think, I'm going to use this situation so I can just do whatever I please. Now, why should you not? Paul gives four reasons here. These are four very powerful reasons why you should not sin using grace as an excuse to continue in that sin. So he asks the question here, do you not know? Again, this is one of Paul's favorite questions. He uses it throughout this epistle and in many of his other epistles. He's saying, don't you know this? Think through this. You know that these truths that I'm about to share with you are true. They are correct. So, let me give you these four reasons. The first reason is in verses 16 through 18. He says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death, or of obedience to righteousness. So he makes a very simple statement here. He says, don't you know that if you yield to sin, you become the slave of sin? Now this is exactly what Jesus pro proclaimed as he shared the gospel. Remember he said to the Pharisees in John 8, 34. He said, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And so he says, 
He's declaring, Paul is declaring the very same thing here. He said, if you, as a professed believer, are continuing to use grace to continue to sin, he's saying, you, you don't get it. You don't see that you're literally giving up your freedom. It's like coming and saying, put the handcuffs on me, take me away. I give up my freedom. I will be your slave for whatever you want me to do. So do you see that that's what takes place when you play with sin? It's a reality. Now probably the best biblical example of someone doing this is the prodigal son. Remember the parable of the prodigal son. Let me read to you just a small portion of it. In Luke 15, verse 11 through 18, it says, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal or literally immoral living. When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate. And no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, there is repentance. He said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. Now we know the end of the story. What did the father do? He saw his son afar off. He ran to him. He fell on his neck. He kissed him and he received him and he forgave him. That is the picture of your heavenly father. That's exactly the way he wants to respond to any repentant sinner. Yet this man, he took his freedom, he used his freedom and literally, he became a slave. He became a slave to someone else in that far country that he went into. There is the example. And so when a person surrenders and plays with sin, they are becoming the slave of sin. Now notice here in this particular verse here, verse 16 at the end, Notice he only gives two options. There isn't a third or a fourth option. There's just two. He said, if you become a slave, he said, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. So this is an either or situation. Either you are a slave of sin or you are a slave of righteousness. You're a slave to your own lust or you are a slave to God. Now, that means that we all have to serve somebody. You remember Bob Dylan's song? We all got to serve somebody. And that is the truth. We're all serving someone. But I serve the Lord. I am his slave because I love him. I am his love slave. So, are you his love slave? Or are you the slave of something else? If you're not his slave, you are a slave to something. I guarantee you. So this is Paul's point here. There is no neutral place. You are either a slave to sin or a slave to God. Jesus said the same thing in Matthew 6, 24. He said, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Jesus said it another way 
in Matthew 12, 30. He said, if you're not with me, you're against me. Notice, it's an either-or situation. There isn't some place in neutral that you can be. So, which end of that spectrum are you in today? Are you his slave? Or are you the slave of something else in your life? Now, notice how you became free. He puts this in verse 17. He says, But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart. And that obedience from the heart, you see, is the key. He places this here so that no one will ever be able to say, Oh, well, I was a slave of sin. I didn't have any choice. I can't do anything else but that. That's not true. You see, there are, there are those in the church today that basically teach, you, you, if you're a slave of sin, if what, whatever's going on in your life, that's just that's who you are. You have no choice over that. Well, I'm sorry, you do have a choice. The choice is repentance. The very first thing Jesus said when he preached the gospel is in Mark chapter 1, verse 15. He said, repent and believe the gospel. That's a choice. Repentance literally means to turn around and go the opposite direction. It's a U-turn. And the U-turn sign is always posted wherever you're driving. Anytime you want to turn around, you can. It's an obedience from the heart. So Paul puts this in here and he says, look, if you start claiming that you can't do this because you're a slave of sin, that's just not correct. The way you got free in the first place was obedience of the heart. You made a decision in your heart. I am not going to live this way anymore. I want to live this way. I don't like the way I, who I am. I don't like what I'm doing. I want something different. Isn't that where you started your Christian life? I mean, I despised my behavior. I despised what I did and what I was doing. And I said, I want to turn. And when somebody shared the gospel with me, I went, here is my way out. Here is how I can turn my life around. And the people that shared the gospel with me were guys that I had partied with all through high school and college. And so I went, what happened to you? You, you, you were just at a party here not a couple of months ago. I saw you. What happened to you? And they went, gave my life to Jesus. I went, what? Are you kidding me? What is this thing you're into? And as they proclaimed that message to me, I went, could this be true? Could there really be forgiveness? Could there really be another way to live? And I tell you, there is. And so this is the option that you have. Obedience from the heart. Obedience is not a feeling. Obedience is a choice. It begins with obedience in the heart. It's a choice that you make. Now, the second reason that Paul gives here for why you should not continue to sin just because you're under grace is he says, if you choose to sin, know that sin is always progressive. Now, not only do you become a slave to whatever you surrender to, but that slavery, that servitude only becomes worse. It's a progressive thing. Now, probably the best way to illustrate this is when you light a match. You light a match? Well, this is an illustration that the Scripture gives for how sin is progressive. That match gets lit, and it starts burning closer and closer to your fingers. And you hold it different directions so it won't burn faster, but it always gets to your fingers, right? Because that's the way sin is. Sin is like a fire. And it is progressive. 
You light a piece of paper on fire and it's going to burn until it consumes the entire thing. If you yield to sin, you become the slave of sin, but that slavery becomes worse and worse. Let me show you this in the scripture. In Isaiah 9.18, here is the way Isaiah describes the progressive nature of sin. He says, for wickedness burns as a fire. You can't say it more clearly than that. It burns like a fire. In the New Testament, in Ephesians 4.22, Paul said, put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to to deceitful lusts. Why do I need to put off the old man? Because it grows corrupt. That's in the present tense. It's continuously growing corrupt. So, did you see that process, that progression in your life? You know, you say, oh, I, I, I won't use that drug. Then you end up using it. Oh, I won't do that to people. I would never do that. And then you find yourself doing it. You see, that's the way it always is. And your life just slowly progress and gets more and more corrupt. Before the flood, that's the way man's nature, that's what, how it, it basically corrupted the whole earth. Before the flood, it says, men were only continually wicked and violent and evil. That was the thought of their heart continuously. That is where our world is headed today as well. And one day there will be judgment that will come upon this nation and upon this world because sin is a progressive thing. The third reason why you should not use grace to continue to sin is in verse 20. Basically because if you allow sin, if you become a slave of sin, you are free or exempt from righteousness. Notice, he says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free, and that word free is a Greek word that means exempt. Exempt in regard to righteousness. Now why does Paul put this here? Well, it's for another rationalization that people have for continuing in sin. They say, well, you know what, it's just who I am. And yet he's saying, look, it's either or. You can't be a slave of sin and still think you're righteous in Christ. Now, does anybody think that? Oh, I, I've talked to professed believers many times that have declared this. They're living and practicing sin and they're going, hey, but I'm a Christian. You know, I asked Jesus into my heart one time 20 years ago. But I'm living like the devil today. I'm living as I please today. Those two don't match. They don't go together. If a person is practicing sin, they are exempt from the righteousness of God. If I am following and a slave of God, I am exempt from the penalty of my sin. It's either or. You can't have both. And so when a person declares this, they don't realize that this is the case. Now, let me show you this in another passage of Scripture. There are many passages that deal with this subject, but here is probably the most clear passage. This is in 1 John chapter 3, verses 4 through 6. Now what I want to do is I want to read this passage to you with the tense of the verbs that are in, this, in the original text. The original text has the present tense, which describes a continuous practice, and then the last two verbs in the very last phrase are in the perfect tense, which describe a past action with present and continuous results today. So, 
Let me read this passage to you the way it should read. It says, Whoever continually commits sin also continually commits lawlessness. And sin is continual lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no continual sin. Whoever continues to abide in him does not continue to practice sin. Whoever continues to practice sin has neither seen him in the past, neither sees him now, nor knows him in the past or knows him now. That's about as clear as you can say it. Now, many times when people read this passage, they, they don't understand the tense of the verbs here, and so they go, well, if anybody sins, they don't know him. Well, does that mean I don't know the Lord? No, he's talking about continual practice of sin, knowingly, willfully, and then saying, oh God, give me grace. That is not going to work because he knows the heart. Now, fourth and last, the fourth reason why you should not use grace as an excuse to sin is because you have to deal with the fruit. In verses 21 through 23, he asks the question, What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? So, I ask you, what was the fruit of the things that you used to do that you are now ashamed of doing? What was the fruit of doing that, of living that way? Well, it was death, was it not? See, I was separated from God, I had no peace inside, and I was ruining my life and everybody else's around me. So, it was death. This is what he means in verse 23 when he says the wages of sin is death. It always has been death. It will always be death. This is always the fruit of sin. This is the fruit. I don't want the fruit of death anymore. I want the other fruit. I want the other wages. You see, the wages of righteousness is eternal life, is real life today and eternal life one day. You see, that's what it's all about. That's what I want. So that's probably the biggest reason why you don't want to willfully choose to sin is because it brings death. So I don't want to willfully hold resentment or bitterness or lust or envy or be jealous. I don't want that in my life because it's going to bring death. Paul said in 1 Timothy 5, 6, it says the woman, and I, you could put the man, who lives in pleasure is dead while she lives. Now that <clears throat> particular verb in that particular sentence as well, she who continually lives and practices sin, seeking pleasure in sin, is dead while she lives. So a person can be a breathing and alive physically and be dead inside dead spiritually. This is what happens to anyone, believer or non-believer. You practice, you yield, you give yourself to any sin, you're going to die. In Romans 8, 6, we will come to this passage where Paul reiterates the same concept. It's the either-or concept. He says, for to be carnally minded is death. To be carnally minded. Carnal describes a fleshly person. Somebody who is ruled by the flesh. He said that person is going to be dead. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Again, it's either or. So really, basically, all you've got to do is just say, what, what's the fruit I'm experiencing in my life? Am I experiencing the life, the joy, the peace, 
of Christ or am I experiencing something else? That determines who you're yielding to. In Romans 8.13, I've ended with this passage for the last couple of studies. I want to end again with this verse. It says, For if we live according to the flesh, he said, you will die. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So this is the promise you see over and over again. And so it's your choice. It's your decision. Which do you want? Which fruit do you want? That will determine what you need to do. So I encourage you today, surrender to Him. Ask for His grace to be poured into you. And to everyone that asks, it will be given. Let's go to Him in prayer. Father, we thank You for Your incredible promise. And Lord, we just want to take advantage of that promise today. Lord, we want to receive Your grace. And so, Lord, I, I pray that You would Lord, just open each of our eyes, Lord, to that, that area of sin where we are still holding. We are still holding on to what is past. And Lord, I pray that you would apply your grace, that you would change the heart, the desire, the thinking. Lord, change us from within so that we just are repulsed by those desires. And we, are, we long for your grace. Lord, we, we ask you to pour out your power right now inside of each one of us. We believe you're doing it. I believe, Lord, you want to set your people free. Let them experience that freedom right now. Thank you, Lord. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ, you're not a Christian, do you want to turn from your sin? Do you want to repent of your sin? If you do, all you have to do is ask Him to forgive you. Right where you sit this morning, He will forgive you. He will change you. He will cleanse your, your heart. He will put away your sin. He will cleanse your heart and your conscience from guilt. And He will justify you and fill you with His Holy Spirit. Do you want that this morning? If you do, I want you to pray with me right now, right where you sit. Just say, Lord, I come to you as a sinner. Say those words. Lord, I'm a sinner. Forgive me. Jesus, come in. Take over my life. I surrender to you now. I want you to be Lord of my life. I ask you to fill me with your spirit right now. Change me. Are you praying with me? Did you just pray with me? For any of you that just prayed that prayer, I, I want you to lift your hand here as a simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with you. God bless you. God bless you. Anyone else here this morning? Let's just agree and let's just pray for these that have made their commitment. Lord, we pray that you would touch these hearts, Lord. Touch these lives. Bring, Lord, that transformation that only you can bring. Lord, work from the inside out today. And Lord, we believe you're doing it right now. Lord, I pray that you would strengthen these hearts in Jesus' name. Amen.